even as King's Landing failed to Rhaenyra Targaryen and her dragons, Prince Aemon One-Eye and Sir Criston Cole were advancing on Harrenhal, whilst the Lannister host under the command of Adrian Tarback after the death of Jason Lannister swept eastwards across the Red Folk. At Acorn Hall, the Westermen were slowed briefly when Lord Joseph Smallwood sallied forth to join Lord Piper and the remnants of his defeated host. Piper died in the battle that ensued, failed when his heart burst at the sight of his favourite grandson's head upon a spear. Smallwood then fell back inside his own castle. A second battle followed three days later, when the Rivermen regrouped under a hedge knight named Sir Harry Penny. The unlikely hero died soon after, while slaying Adrian Tarback. Once more, the Lannisters and the Westermen prevailed, cutting down the Rivermen as they fled. When the Western host resumed, it marched to Harrenhal. It was now under the banner of Lord Humphrey Lefford, who had suffered so many wounds in the prior battles, he had to command from a litter. Little did Lord Lefford suspect that he'd soon face a much tougher test, for an army of fresh foes was descending upon them from the north. 2,000 savage Northmen, flying Queen Rhaenyra's banner. At their head rode the Lord of Barrington, Roderick Dustin, a warrior so old and hoary, men called him Roddy the Ruin. His host was made up of grizzled greybeards in old mail and ragged skins. Every man among them a seasoned warrior, every man a horse. They called themselves the Winter Wolves. We have come to die for the Dragon Queen, Lord Roderick announced when he reached the twins, when Lady Sabbatha Frey rode out to greet them. Meanwhile, muddy roads and brainstorms slowed the pace of Aemon's advance from King's Landing, but his host was made up largely of footmen with long baggage train. Sir Criston Cole's vanguard fought and won a short, sharp battle against Sir Oswald Wode and the lords of Darry and Root on the lakeshore, but met no other opposition. After 19 days of constant marching, they reached their destination, Harrenhal. When they got there, they found the castle gates open, with Prince Daemon and all his men gone. Prince Aemon had kept Vagar with the main column throughout the march, thinking that his uncle might attempt to attack them on Caraxes. Retrospectively, it would seem odd that he didn't. He reached Harrenhal a day after Cole, and that night celebrated a great victory. Daemon and his river scum had fled. Rather than face a worthy foe, Aemon proclaimed. Small wonder then, that when word of the fall of King's Landing reached him, the prince felt thrice the fall. His fury was fearsome to behold. First to suffer for this was Sir Simon Strong. Prince Aemon had no love for any of that ilk, and the haste with which the Castilian had yielded Harrenhal to Daemon Targaryen was enough to convince him that the old man was a traitor. Simon Strong protested his innocence, insisting that he was a true and loyal servant of the crown, that his own great nephew, Laris Strong, and the clubfoot, was lord of Harrenhal and King Aegon's master of whispers, and had served Aemon loyally, he reminded the prince regent. These denials only inflamed Aemon's suspicions further. Clubfoot was a traitor as well then, he decided. How else would Daemon and Rhaenyra have known when King's Landing would be most vulnerable? Someone on the Green Council had sent word to them, and Laris Clubfoot was Harwin Strong's brother, and thus an uncle to Rhaenyra's bastards. Aemon commanded that Sir Simon be given a sword. Let the gods decide if you speak truly, he said. If you are innocent, the warrior will give you strength to defeat me. The door that followed was utterly one-sided. All accounts agree. The prince cut the old man to pieces then fed his mutilated corpse to Vagar. Nor did Sir Simon's grandsons long outlive him. One by one, every man and boy with strong blood in his veins was dragged forth and put to death until the heap made of their heads stood three feet tall. Thus did House Strong, an ancient and long line of noble warriors, boasting descent from the first men, come to an ignoble end in the ward at Harrenhal. No trueborn strong was spared, nor any bastards, save oddly, Alice Rivers, though the famed wet nurse was twice his age, three times his age if we put trust in Mushroom's account, it was widely known that Prince Aemon had taken her into his bed as a prize of war soon after capturing Harrenhal, seemingly preferring her to all the other women of the castle, including many pretty young maids of his own age. West of Harrenhal, fighting continued in the Riverlands as the Lannister host slogged onwards. The age and infirmity of their commander, Lord Lefford, had slowed their march to butter cruel. As they neared the western shore of the God's Eye, they found a huge new army athwart their path. Roddy the Ruin and his winter wolves had joined with Forest Frey, Lord of the Crossing, and Red Rob Rivers, known as the Bowmen of Raventree. Northmen 
number 2000. The phrase commanded 200 knights and thrice as many footmen. Rivers brought 300 archers with him to the battle, and scarce had Lord Lefford halted to confront the foe in front of him when more enemies appeared to the south, where Longleaf, the Lion Slayer, and a ragged band of survivors from the earlier battles had been joined by Lord Biddleston, Chambers, and Perrin. Caught between these two foes, Lefford hesitated to move against either for fear the other falling on his rear. Instead, he put his back to the lake, dug in, and sent ravens to Prince Aemon at Harrenhal, begging his aid, knowing it was their only hope. Though a dozen birds, not one ever reached the prince. Red Rob Rivers, said to be the finest archer in all of Westeros, took them down. More rivermen turned up the next day, led by Sir Galbert Grey, Lord John Charlton, and the new Lord of Raventree, the 11-year-old Benjicott Blackwood. With their numbers augmented by these fresh levies, Queen's men agreed that the time had come to attack. Best make an end to these lions before the dragon comes, said Roddy the Ruin. The bloodiest land battle of the Dance of Dragons began the next day, with the rising of the sun. The annals of the citadel, it is known as the Battle of the Lakeshore, but to those men who live to tell the tale of it, always be known as the Fish Feed. <laughs>